Well, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I'm going to briefly uh, introduce the uh, topic, um, and then uh, I'll introduce each uh, uh, panelist in turn as, I, uh, turn as I ask them uh, what I hope will be a fairly straightforward question. Uh, then I might ask them a few more difficult questions, um, and then we'll open up to, to all of you to hopefully ask even more difficult questions. Um, and at the end, there'll be a reception uh, where if you have any questions that you just thought were too impossible for them to answer on stage and you thought it would be impolite, you can ask them uh, during the reception. Um, in a little over two weeks, uh, a teeming mass of world leaders uh, is going to descend on New York. Um, the Pope, Vladimir Putin, uh, President Obama. Uh, it'll be the largest ever gathering of heads of state. Um, and they'll all sign up to a set of targets on progress between now and 2030 that uh, is ambitious to say the least. Uh, we're going to wipe out extreme poverty, uh, uh, end malnutrition, uh, uh, end all uh, child deaths, uh, avoidable child deaths the world over, and that's just the start. Uh, amongst these sustainable development goals are global and universal access uh, to water, to sanitation, to reliable modern energy, um, and to communications technologies. Now, any set of development targets um, uh, about uh, any set of global development targets should um, include infrastructure. Um, you know, simply there is no wealthy country in the world that sees electricity consumption at below 3,000 3, kilowatt hours per year. For example, Ethiopia sees a consumption level of 51 kilowatt hours per year, one one sixtieth that amount. Now, clean water and good sanitation are vital to improvements in health. Uh, with knock-on effects on, on education and productivity. Um, and it's actually a surprising omission in such a, a long list of targets uh, as the Sustainable Development Goals has become that you don't actually see roads in there at all <coughs> or, or ports or airports, despite how vital they are to exchange. But as the example of uh, electricity in Ethiopia shows, we are a long way from adequate uh, provision of infrastructure in many developing countries. And back of the envelope calculations by uh, uh, the UN suggest that it would take about a trillion dollars of additional infrastructure investment a year over the next 15 years to get anywhere close to meeting the Sustainable Development Goal infrastructure targets. A trillion dollars a year. And that begs the question, where's the money going to come from? Well, there was a, a, a meeting of global finance ministers and aid ministers in Addis a, a, a few months ago where basically they pointed to domestic resource mobilization, largely taxes, um, as the largest source for, for development finance. But they also suggested a big role for the private sector, private investments leveraged by international support um, from uh, aid through guarantees. The, the question for today is, is that plausible, um, especially in the countries that need it most, like Ethiopia? At the moment, investment in infrastructure with private involvement runs at about 180 billion a year in developing countries. Pretty good, but less than one fifth of the supposed additional investment needed a year. Um, and poorer countries and regions like Sub Saharan Africa get a fraction of that. Um, and indeed, when you look at Sub Saharan Africa, four fifths of investment with uh, private involvement over the last 20 years has been in, in one sector, in telecommunications. Over that same period, the region has attracted an average of just 332 million a year to private electricity investments. That's 332 million spread over the entire region, uh, and it's about, give or take, the cost of half of a power plant. Um, so what is it plausible to imagine that the private sector could deliver when it comes to infrastructure in the poorest countries in Africa? You know, what are the barriers to a much larger engagement? Are they surmountable? And what's the role for donors and the multilaterals um, uh, when it comes to leveraging that investment? Um, we have an absolutely fantastic panel uh, to discuss these questions, and I'm, I'm going to sit down now and introduce them uh, one by one and ask them a question. Um, but thank you very much for coming, and, and thank you for being here too. So um, Elizabeth Littlefield um, uh, is the president of CEO of OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Um, as the name suggests, uh, uh, OPIC uh, finances private investments in developing countries uh, while generating uh, uh, an income for the federal budget, um, uh, a number that reached 426 million in 2013. As a taxpayer, I thank you. Um, uh, Elizabeth has uh, also been appointed by President Obama to serve as a, a member of the White House Development Council uh, and is on the President's Export Council. So Elizabeth, 
Where has OPEC seen success in supporting infrastructure in developing countries, and in particular low-income countries like Africa? You know, where have you found it easier and where more difficult? And does it vary dramatically by, by, by sector and by type of investment? Right. Well, thank, thank you very much, and thank you all to, for spending some of your uh, afternoon with us on this very small topic. <laughs> um, so I think, I mean, I think any discussion probably needs to start with really distinguishing, when, when we talk about private provision of finance for infrastructure, a distinction between what can plausibly be financed uh, with commercial capital versus that which needs subsidy. And pretty much every one of the four key sectors, to, to my mind, breaks down in between that which really is hard to do that way and that which isn't. So just in OPIC's own experience, um, if you take each of the sectors, so from po the power perspective, obviously we've had a huge, uh, a huge boon on the power side. We're, we've seen our portfolio grow tenfold in the first three years, and we've been doing about a billion dollars a year now. But that's only on the generation side. So obviously, we know transmission and distribution is a lot harder to finance commercially. On the water side, you know, most people would generally say, well, water is hard, to, politically hard to do uh, on a commercial basis. But we found in a number of cases when governments were willing to subsidize the provision of clean water, in our case, places like Jordan and Algeria, it's worked actually quite, quite well. Um, transportation, we all know, you know, local roads is pretty hard to do. Uh, but toll roads is possible, and frankly, airports and ports uh, can be done. We've done that quite successfully uh, all over the world. And then, as you mentioned, Charles, um, ICT, of course, uh, is an area that's, that's almost exclusively financed, now, not privately. So um, those are the kind of sectors that we've, been, what we've seen the most activities. But I thought what, what I might do is, just in two minutes, is just touch on and maybe just list the kind of key barriers that we see to the flow of private capital often uh, enhanced by, by development finance institutions to some of these sectors. Um, and because I think it's the conventional wisdom is no longer this, as, as it was just a few years ago. So normally people would say, if you were to list, say, the five things that we need to fix to make more capital flow, they would, they would range from, number one, you know, it's the financing is not available in the right shape at the right time. These deals are too big. They're too risky. They're too long. Sometimes they involve multiple countries. It's too complicated. Uh, number two, the credit risk allocation between the country and the, and the private investor is really difficult to get right. Um, and that's especially true now that in Africa, you mentioned, you know, 10 years ago, two thirds of the power that was being generated was for export before. And now two thirds is for domestic consumption, which means you have to look at the off takers. And that makes the risk sharing more complicated. Um, three is they're really, really hard. The effort and the scrutiny of stakeholders sometimes is a chilling effect on <laughs> willingness of commercial players to want to get involved in something where they may have uh, a lot of opposition or a lot of uh, consultation required. And then the last two I would mention is most people say, well, the number one uh, hindrance is policy and regulatory frameworks are not quite right. The enabling environment doesn't work. There's been some interesting surveys from in, uh, the e, um, Economic Intelligence Unit in surveying investors, and that uh, survey showed that only about 13% of them cited policy and regulation or investment climate as being a, a critical factor for them. But 80% or more, I think it was, cited something very different as being the number one, and that's my fifth. And that is political will and capacity. And I think this is a really interesting thing that I certainly would love to hear GE and, and Bechtel opine on. Because often we're saying it's the government lacks a sense of urgency, lacks the capacity, or lacks the willingness to go out there and stick their, their necks out and make a tough decision because they're afraid they don't trust the private sector, which I think is all true. But we also see that the private sector, with all due respect to my good colleagues, has had some role in this because in the past there have been some deals that have been structured that were regrettable or where information asymmetries were abused. And so I think one of the key things we see is building trust between the private sector operators and the governments that need the polit political will and the stiffened spine to make tough decisions is the area that I would say we see as the, the, the biggest need um, in our experience working in, in these sectors. Thank you. A, a lot that I and I'm sure uh, uh, other panel members will want to come back on. But uh, uh, Marianne, uh, uh, Marianne Fay is currently the uh, chief economist of a sustainable vice presidency at the World Bank. Uh, she co-directed the World Development Report in 2010 on development and climate change. But as a sign of how long she's been involved with infrastructure issues, uh, she was also on the 1994 World Development Report mm -hmm. team, uh, Infrastructure for Development. 
Um, that report, no, I took a quick look, uh, covered pricing issues, regulation, competition, and the complex role of private investment. So you can see how far the discussion of infrastructure and development has moved on since then. Um, Marianne, I mean, picking up on uh, Elizabeth's last point, I mean, uh, a, are the policy and regulatory issues becoming easier in sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, you know, uh, are, are situations improving? And in which case, what, you know, what do you see as the biggest domestic barriers to more private investment in infrastructure in, in, in Africa and in low-income countries in general? Before I answer your question, mm -hmm. I'd like to make maybe a couple of points. And, and one is that I would argue that perhaps one of the biggest barriers to uh, what, one of the reasons they tend to be a little bit of disappointment around the performance of the private sector or private sector financing on infrastructure is unrealistic expectations. And I think Elizabeth pointed to the fact that you know, there are some sectors that are simply not well suited to private participation or certainly not suited to full private sector participation. And I think it's, it's really important that, that we keep in mind that the private sector will only come in if it's going to make money. Um, when you go outside of the sort of the infrastructure practitioner world, there seems to be a sense that we're going to fix all the problems of the infrastructure world through private par participation. And indeed, there's a lot that the private sector can do. I think there's really strong evidence now that private sector uh, participation improves efficiency. Um, it doesn't necessarily reduce the cost of an overall project. And it certainly uh, requires, once again, that uh, there be some, some financing that's self-generating. So from that point of view, um, I don't completely agree with Elizabeth uh, on this idea that the regulatory environment is perhaps less important. Because what we do tend to see, for example, in the water sector, is that it's, it's very difficult for countries. And, and maybe it depends where you put the bar of, of government commitment and government capacity. But there is limited willingness and, and, and ability to, to get into full cost recovery and these kinds of things. So I think that's, that's a really, really important thing. Um, what we see as the biggest obstacle is the lack of a good pipeline. And I think uh, over the last couple of years, we've, we've managed to change a lot of the discussion from this argument that you know, there's not enough money. Because until a few years ago, a lot of the debate was around how do you just make more money available. And in the end, and I'd, I'd be curious to hear what my fellow panelists think about this, but we tend to see just, in a way, too much money chasing too few projects. Uh, there are just not that many good, solid, bankable projects. So the question then becomes, how do you increase the pipeline of bankable projects? And good, hopefully good bankable projects uh, that, that do have development impact. And there, I think, uh, the government willingness that, and capacity that you were talking about is, is really critical. But um, there's also, of course, the, the whole regulatory environment. And part of the issue is that very few countries have the kind of finance necessary to do the, the real upstream uh, preparation. And you know, there's, there's two kinds of what I would call upstream pro project preparation. One is really the overall environment, and that's the regulatory framework, uh, the, 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 the cost recovery policies, all these kinds of things. It's also the conflict rev resolution mechanisms and so on and so forth. And then there's, there's a more sort of pre-feasibility studies. You, know, you might need to build the road to go to that particular site where you might eventually do uh, uh, build a dam. And there are very few private sector companies that are or very rarely would a private sector company be willing to get in that early. And what we see amongst our client countries is that they're usually reluctant to borrow for this kind of, of spending. So the, there seems to have, the, the impression that we had was that there was a real sort of market failure in the financing of that really upstream uh, uh, preparation. So one of the things we've done is create this global infrastructure facility, which we refer to as the GIF. Uh, and this GIF is supposed to be able to, to finance this kind of pre-feasibility that can be up to 10% of project cost in really poor countries and, and countries that don't have a lot of experience with the private sector. So by now, I've forgotten what question you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> but you kind of answered it. <laughs> Thank you. I think you ought to put a T on that and make it a gift. <laughs> <Yeah>. Good idea. <laughs>
Jay Island. Jay is the uh, president and CEO of, of GE Africa. Uh, he heads GE's uh, operations on the subcontinent across uh, power generation, healthcare, transportation, oil and gas, and aviation. Uh, Jay is a member of uh, President Obama's newly established Advisory Council on Doing Business in Africa and also serves as a vice chair on the board of directors of the Corporate Council on Africa. Jay, I mean, you, you've already heard, uh, uh, you know, regulation and pricing, political will, uh, bankable projects. These are these are linked things, obviously. But uh, you know, is is what you're hearing uh, from your fellow panelists what you're experiencing on the ground, or is there? Yeah, it's all of the above, right. um, <clears throat> not all the time. But I think, I think there's a couple of key things. One is um, there are the easy projects. There aren't really any easy projects. Um, there's always, you know, and if you look at any of the any of the projects that we look at, whether it's healthcare, power, um, you know, locomotives, et cetera, it's all about the value chain because you ca we cannot go in and just sell a turbine or a locomotive or you know some diagnostic imaging equipment without figuring out the whole solution, if you will, which includes financing. Uh, for number one. So I think when, when you look at that and what, what Elizabeth said, I think is at least in the power side, what's getting neglected, tr generation is the easiest thing to finance if you have all the other stuff. Okay, so transmission and distribution, if, no, if we're not going to have any investment in transmission and distribution, there is not going to be a lot of generation that's going to be required because there's nowhere to evacuate it. But the transmission and distribution is not, you'll never get a bank to, to do that. And that's got to be a country, a development bank. It's got to be a different level of investment and type of investment. Um, you know, and then tied into that is a credible off taker, which I think is, you know, again, if, and that gets into the political will and, you know, the issue of are you going to collect the money? Are you going to be able to pay? Um, are you charging the right tariffs, et cetera? Um, the generation, like I said, the generation, once you have those, that's not a real hard thing to finance. Um, and then, t depending on the country, is the fuel, which is another piece of making sure you got the right fuel, whether it's sun, wind, natural gas, whatever. Um, and I think all of those become problematic. And, and, and then tied into that is to get the, to the private sector to finance is some kind of backing, sovereign guarantee, credit enhancement, something that's going to make sure that they feel comfortable about, about giving that loan. And that's where you get into the balance sheet of the com countries and what, what they're able to do and how do they do the priorities. So all of that adds up to the complexity and trying to get things done. <clears throat> and, it's, and it's difficult. Um, and, you know, you get part of it's on our, it's, part of it's on us as, as private sector to kind of come up. We can't go in with developed market solutions into a developing market. We have to think a little more creatively. We've been able to do a project in Kenya with the Ministry of Health, uh, outfitting 98 hospitals with, with diagnostic imaging suites. Um, and the, the way it was sold or was able to get through is it was a seven-year deal with maintenance, but it's a pay as you go. So we're able to convince some banks, some financing, et cetera, tied into it. So there's, those are the kind of things that have to be done. If we're going to keep requiring full cash up front or letters of credit and all the fully backing, projects are going to take a long time. Now, I think, you know, if you look at the Nigerian power sector, back to your, back to your point earlier about the private sector um, confidence or the public sector confidence in the private sector. You know, we've had, we, we would sell previously, you know, last decade, et cetera, we would sell turbines to the utility. And you'd say, do you want us to install them? Or No, we'll take care of it. The problem is, then it's our turbines, but it's up to them to put them in. And they didn't want any of that because they were managing it themselves. So then it comes down, why aren't those GE turbines getting installed? You know, you guys... And it's, so there's a little bit of a combination of, of both around that. And I think it's up to us. So we've gone in and, you know, worked and gotten most of them done. Um, but then now we have a privatization of Nigeria, which is going to be helpful. Or you have a country like Cote d'Ivoire that says, we don't, all we want to do is buy power 
at a price, and here's the price. Finance, you know, all IPPs. And through all of their issues over the last 10 years, they, the power was on and they paid. So, I mean, there are different ways to attack it and I, to, to, again, balance the, the issues that, you, that have been already identified. But it's, we're going to have to work, work hard in figuring that out. But it's not, there is plenty of capital available in the private sector. The problem is it's not going to be that, <clears throat> that capable of being put into Africa. Okay, Basel III on the commercial banks present a problem. You've got obviously the risk perceptions, et cetera, et cetera, that all drive into that. So I think it's, you know, it's a challenge. And, but there's a lot of opportunity and the infrastructure needs have to get fixed or otherwise you're gonna have a billion people that are gonna be disenfranchised and we're seeing some of that in a very small scale now. Not in Africa, but every other areas of the world. Thank you, that's absolutely. Tam, um, Tam Wen, uh, uh, the, the Global Head of uh, Sustainability at Bechtel Corporation, uh, directs the overall formulation and Im implementation of uh, enterprise sustainability strategy. Uh, you also lead the uh, uh, Special Enterprise Initiatives, Project Support and Policy Planning on a range of global sustainability issues. Tam serves as the Vice Chair of Corporate Responsibility Committee of the US Council for International Business and an Executive Officer of uh, Chevron's uh, Niger Delta Partnership Foundation. Uh, you've also, uh, uh, Tam's also worked for, for, for Chevron, the Asian Development Bank, and the Inter-American Development Bank, so uh, straddles somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, Jay said part of it's on us, and I, I, I thought that was uh, an interesting line. We usually sort of think, of, or at least perhaps it's my background, I usually think of, of, of policy and regulatory and uh, project preparation and so on as being sort of an issue for countries, possibly with the assistance of, 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 of donors. But you're actually heading up uh, Bechtel's work with promoting local economic development and its role in creating policy space for sustainable private infrastructure investment. Um, so, you know, are there lessons uh, emerging from your experience regarding how the private sector itself can help make the environment better for investment? Sure. <coughs> the, uh, you know, the, the conversations that we have now on financing projects has changed quite a bit. We're talking not just to traditional donors, but private equity, sovereign wealth funds. You have people not, they don't just want to lend to projects, they also want to own uh, the projects. So it's a different, completely different risk tolerance. And our, we are always trying to talk to them to incentivize them to pursue projects uh, with us. And so I think my, uh, Jay was right, and, and I think my colleagues were quite accurate on the constraints. Uh, there is money out there on the private sector side, but there's definitely a lot of constraints of how that's gonna move in you know, really risky projects, you know, uh, private equity would be quite nervous investing over 30 years uh, in a project in some of these uh, markets. So some of that money tends to move to the US or, or Europe. On our side, to try to answer your question to enable this, you know, we've tried to be creative and flexible. We work closely with the government. We work closely with donors. One uh, example that uh, is live uh, that we're doing now is in um, Gabon. It's a it's a massive, uh, you know, multi-billion dollar national infrastructure project, but if you deconstruct the project and you look at the elements that we're trying to do to incentivize, I mean, it's all designed to bring in external financing as well as promote economic development. One, a one aspect of that project is where we worked side by side with the Gabonese government to create an agency to actually execute the project. The issue that my colleagues raised about capacity is massive. Uh, the leaders generally understand the project. It's that middle management, civil servant level. Of how do you translate a plan into execution? And that requires quite a bit of capacity. So it's an interesting model. I wouldn't say it's perfect, in a, in a, and it's still a learning <coughs> for the company. But it's an interesting where we came in together to share practices, everything from project management to accounting to how to write a tender to make sure that you are, um, that money is flowing to small businesses, uh, to quality control, environmental standards, modernizing the construction sector, uh, and how to actually uh, interpret uh, an execution plan. And we, gener we came in sort of a one-to-one -one or three-to-three -three and gradually, you know, we're phasing ourselves out the capacity as the, as, as the Gabonese improve, they take over the agency and start owning and, and executing the project. Uh, I can't say that this, I can't attribute this to uh, additional investment, but uh, the, the Chinese Exim Bank has come in, uh, the French aid agency has come in, 
Uh, Gabon's own, I believe, Sovereign Wealth Fund has invested in it. Uh, and I think there's been some private concessions. So I think that's some of the example. That's a, an example of trying to support the policy space, but at a practical level, how do you just uh, understand and execute a, a massive uh, national infrastructure plan uh, and build that local capacity as well as bringing, so Bechtel also brings the standards uh, that Bechtel brings to projects uh, to modernize the construction sector, you know. Stuff that we take for granted here, you know, environmental safety standards, all that to help sort of also incentivize uh, external financing investors to come in to say, hey, you know, here is a country that's trying to, uh, that's modernizing its sector and uh, maybe a destination for investment. Um, this all sounds uh, uh, reasonably positive. Can I push back a bit um, and actually take uh, the, the, the sector that, that Jay said was sort of one of the easiest and, uh, and Elizabeth mentioned uh, up at the top, um, which is power production. Um, uh, you know, it isn't all a pretty picture in, in that sector, especially uh, in, in, in developing countries. Uh, um, you know, deals have broken down with uh, recriminations and accusations of foul play all around. I mean, Tanzania, the I I IPTL, for example, uh, a deal to a huge scandal. Uh, uh, there was a, a double uh, power deal in India a few years before. Um, and both scandals had their own individual features, but uh, uh, one of the bottom line was something you mentioned, that the, the power was being sold at a very high price. And there was a, a good reason why the power was being sold at a very high price. Um, uh, infrastructure power plants take a lot of money to build up front, and the payback period is over you know, many years. Um, if you're a private sector investor in a risky country and you're facing a payback period over many years, you are going to demand a high return to make up for that risk. A high return means higher prices for electricity, which can be politically um, you know, uh, difficult for countries to bear. Um, and it, isn't there just sort of a natural limit, even on the easier bits of infrastructure, on how much investment we are likely to see in low-income countries and fragile states uh, 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 developing? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think, you know, you're right on, a, on a, some of that stuff. Um, number one, I think, first of all, you've got to forget the cost of capital, okay? You've got to cover the cost of fuel. You've got to cover the cost of the investment. And I think that's, when you look at a number of countries, a lot of the power prices are, are um, subsidized. At the and, and what happens is that chews up the government's balance sheet. So are you, bet, are you, you know, and there you get into the political will discussion. And, and that's, so, you know, you go into some countries and, and you know, they want to sell, they want to have power at six cents or eight cents. I mean, that's less than you pay here. And so it's like, those are the kind of things that I think there's got to be an understanding of of what has to happen from a standpoint of having an investable value chain. Again, whether it's being 7% return or a 20% return, just to take the basics, and I think that's one. And then you've got on top of that the financing. And, you know, <laughs> private equity going into a power plant, you know, that's to me is a very expensive short-term money. It's very hard uh, from a standpoint of satisfying a lot of what they do. What pension plans, People that need a long period of a long return, um, you know, pretty um, good returns over a long period of time. Those are the kind of things. There's a lot of untapped money in, in Africa. Why can't we use the pension funds and the sovereign wealth funds to invest in their own country to, in some of these long s cycle projects, et cetera, that can then drive economic growth? So I mean, there's some of that. And there, and just one last thing, we to say that it can be done quickly. We just did in Egypt. We, in November, we negotiated with the president for um, emergency power. We put two gigawatts on in August, by August. Nine months, eight months. It can be done, but he was driving it to his power, you know, trying to break through all of the, the longer you have to develop these projects, the more potential for all of the bad stuff that can happen. So that's. I'm happy to. So totally jump in on that, but I wanted to say just I, I completely agreed with what Marianne said also about the need for these for cost covering tariffs. That's sort of the non 
that's sort of the, mm -hmm. the you know the binary decision. If it's not cost covering, you're not going to get the capital in. But I think um, uh, we have well. And the other thing that's interesting is I hear governments angsting over agreeing to a tariff that's a cost covering tariff for months and months and months, not thinking about the externalities of what's happening when they don't have power for six months. Mm -hmm. So the cost of delaying a decision while you're angsting and nickel and diming over a few cents on the tariff is, is oftentimes not considered uh, by the government who's doing the angsting. But then I think the other thing I would say is there's, I think there's a couple of huge opportunities we have right now which should make this easier. One is that off-grid energy in Africa has now, you know, is now an investable asset and is showing some success. We have technologies that are, the technology price are coming down so much that these, that the cost covering tariffs are now feasible. And then frankly, if there ever was a time to do subsidy reform, it's now when, you know, when fossil fuel prices are as low as they are. So I think we have a confluence of factors right now that means that, that the, the hope of convincing governments to do cost covering agreed. tariffs is, a, is an opportunity, you know, now that, like it wasn't before. And ironically, in the solar business in the United States, you don't have cost recovery tariffs without it being subsidized. So, so you know, the, the as an example. Yeah. And, I mean, the cost recovery is interesting. You know, somebody once pointed out to me that there are more people in the world who have cell phones than have toilets, right? And, and that the worst thing that uh, we ever did was to talk about water as a human right, because cell phones are not a human right, and as a result, everybody accepts that there's full cost recovery on cell phones. And as a result, we have more people who have cell phones than people who have toilets. Um, so I think the, the, the whole cost recovery thing, so in the case of Africa, there's, there's one place to start also, which is that there are tremendous efficiency gains that can be had to reduce those tariffs that need to be done. We, we did a study a few years ago um, that showed that about two thirds of the finance, the, the, the the cost of infrastructure could be covered, uh, the, the financing gap could be covered by efficiency gains uh, at all levels, uh, including you know, governments actually dispersing their funds, operations and maintenance, and so on and so forth. So you know, there's a lot that can be done there. And second, on, on, on the whole sort of the politics of cost recovery, the last couple, a couple of years, we've been doing a lot of work on fossil fuel subsidy reform. And one of the things that is very interesting is the extent to which there's misperception around fossil fuel subsidy uh, by the population. So for example, in, in, in Egypt, where um, I think something like 3 or 4% of GDP, or some enormous amount of money, something like 30% of the government budget was going into fossil fuel subsidy reform, we did a survey that showed that most people didn't know that it was particularly significant. Uh, same thing in Morocco. Most people thought that LPG was not subsidized, found it quite expensive. But when asked whether they would rather spend, you know, 17% of government budget on LPG subsidy or on increasing expenditures on, on schooling, there was, you know, a, a, a clear response. So a lot of it is about the social marketing. It's about the explaining. It's about understanding why people are upset about a tariff increase. In Nigeria, there were riots when when uh, fuel prices were increased, because the and it was the middle class, by the way, rioting in general. The government reluctance is supposedly around the poor, but in fact, it is the middle class that riots. So the argument in in Nigeria was, people were saying, look, this is the only thing we get from our government, is cheap oil. If you take that away from us, what what are we getting from the government? So I think working around, you know, having a, a whole plan around. How are we going to make the tariff increase acceptable is a big part of the mm -hmm. success, and it can be done. Now, there's always a problem of sequencing. Do you increase the tariff first so that then you can attract the investors, or do you improve the quality of service? Because yes, people will complain if you double the tariff and you don't improve the quality of service. So I think, to go back to your original question, is there a limit to how much private sector investment we can see in Africa or in low-income countries? For sure there is. But are we at that limit in Africa? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, something, um, pricing has come up, and uh, 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 Elizabeth, you mentioned uh, solar. Um, uh, there is a closely linked discussion, and, and, and you've already had half of it, I guess, about um, uh, uh, sustainability, environmental sustainability in Paris and 
carbon prices and so on. I mean, is, is there something that could come out of Paris uh, that would actually make it easier to do more uh, infrastructure investment in Africa? I mean, you know, part of that maybe being a greater push for, for, for tariff reform. Well, Africa uses it, I mean, Elizabeth pointed out to the need or, or the fact that, that off-grid is becoming much more interesting uh, in Africa and uh, cost competitive. And the other thing is Africa is a region that is using only about, what, 10, 15 percent of its hydro potential. Um, you know, what kind of investment, I see you smiling for that opening, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but the point is, you know, if, if uh, more climate finance were to come out of maybe not Paris, but the general climate negotiation in the next few years, it could help sweeten the deals uh, for, for investment in more sustainable infrastructure. I think climate change on one hand makes infrastructure more complicated because, you know, building greener is often more expensive, there are new technologies, there's new different kinds of risk and so on and so forth. But at the same time it might help because it does bring a new source of financing. Uh, you know, a willingness by countries to be to co-finance uh, all sorts of projects that they weren't necessarily interested in otherwise. Mm -hmm. I think I think there's two things. One is uh, on the off-grid comment. I, I agree fully with Elizabeth on off-grid mm. uh, is becoming better, but that's not going to drive. Off. That's about access. It's not about economic development. To to really put it, I mean, I know we disagree a little bit on that, but you know, <laughs> I you know most of if you're gonna if you're gonna get more you know manufacturing capability, all of the broader things, that's going to have to be with. But Big call power. that growth, not the, I mean, development. Well, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, You're surrounded. So, yeah, yeah, I guess Give so. Up. So <laughs> growth, okay. Which we need because if you get the economic growth, then you we have need, more. Absolutely. So I think there's a balance of both, and it's a combination of access as well as, as capability. I think it's a, and that's the, the dy dynamic. The country, ironically, the country that has the most power in the, in the region and the most developed country is in blackout time, which is South Africa. A lot of reasons. Um, but again, there's another issue about what the tariffs are and you know, what, what they should be, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's a real issue. Well, and the investments in the transmission and distribution yep. that we talked about earlier yep. too, right? So, so, so you did perhaps just one other thing. I mean, one of the big problems in Africa is so many countries are too small to have mm -hmm. the kind of really economically viable and <coughs> low cost uh, generation that's needed. So, you know, one of the big, big challenges in Africa are these transmission line and, you know, regional power pools and so on and so forth. So, you know, could Paris help at all and provide more momentum around that? I directly, certainly not, but indirectly, perhaps. Let's be optimistic. You, you did give me an opening, Marianne, and I, I, I want to move on to the to the donor role, um, uh, and I'll come back to uh, 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 the role for um, um, large dams in a minute. Um, like but uh, don't ask about that. <laughs> <laughs> there is a question on the on the donor side. Clearly, there there is this issue about how 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 do you um, uh, reduce risk to to uh, private players uh, for these long-term investments, and you know, one answer obviously is, is guarantees, uh, various forms of uh, of donor finance, um, and they they have been playing a role. You know, uh, and 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 uh, OPIC and IFC and, and MEGA all have been investing in uh, in power, for example. But there is a scale question, right? I mean, uh, OPIC's total portfolio in everything is about eighteen billion, right? Um, the IFC is dispersing 10 billion a year, um, and a small fraction of that is going to infrastructure, and a tiny fraction of that is going to infrastructure in low-income countries that isn't telecoms. Um, MEGA's total country cap, it can only guarantee up to 720 million per country, which doesn't really buy you a power plant. Um, well, bank guarantees are, are, are pretty much dead. Uh, um, you know, I guess for the private sector uh, uh, representatives here, you know, do you think there is a, given these constraints, do you think there is a role for, for uh, a big role for, for donors and uh, international organizations? And, and for, the, uh, for, for, for our OPIC and World Bank colleagues, how can you scale up 
to be bigger and more important if if we're talking about you know, massively trying to massively increase investment, private investment in infrastructure in Africa? I can start. I, uh, my, my quick answer is yes. I, I, I still see, uh, and Bechtel still sees a, a, a strong role for uh, the donors. And it's not just, yeah, there's, there's constraints and maybe limits to the instruments and the caps and things. But they always had, uh, in my opinion, and I, and I had worked in uh, two of the banks, they always had the, the value of the, the convening power. Uh, bringing players together, being that neutral party, allowing, being sometimes a catalyst for additional funding. Uh, I always saw that. And then all the uh, derivatives of what they do, the research and things. But that convening power I still see is a, you know, it's, it's still a, a valuable role that the private, I mean, in my opinion, the private sector uh, still needs when it's working in, in a lot of these high risk markets. Well, I, I think the one thing on this is if you get guarantees, you shouldn't be at the private sector shouldn't be asking for a 23 percent return right because they're you know just because it, you know, once you get the guarantee you take the risk equation out right so why are you getting a risk adjusted return of a and i think that there's still a lot of that mis mistiming or mi misviews uh as, as we look in some of the projects because you get people that are interested they want a guarantee but they also want a high rate and i don't think that you know i think that you got to match those expectations so I, you know, that's, and I think the other thing that, that from a donor, any, any guarantee is, is actually, you, you, mul has a multiple effect because then you can take that and go get it financed, you know, the debt financed or whatever. And I think, so a dollar of debt isn't worth as much as almost a dollar of guarantee because you then have that, you know, that multiplier effect to be able to go and get the project financed elsewhere. Oh, that we should be able to do better than 100% sovereign guarantees. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I agree with you on that, even though I don't agree with you on development. <laughs> <definition>. <laughs> um, can I just address that, the, your two questions, um, briefly? So on the, do, do donors have a role? I would say that the Power Africa Initiative is a great example of the, fa the fact that donors can play a role. Uh, in this, um, you know, President Obama's Power Africa Initiative which you know, some were skeptical about how much could be done quickly uh, within, you know, coordinating within the government. It's uh, for me, it's been a tremendous success, and I think and USAID has done a, a really great job of coordinating the the work of other U.S. government agencies there. Um, you know, that initiative, first of all, we're you know we keep we keep double, doubling the targets every year because it's worked so well, um, and it's done three things that I think were not expected by anybody. One, it's brought an unprecedented level of coordination amongst the U.S. government agencies. Some, you may have experienced this, mm -hmm. um, Tam and, and Jay, uh, investors are able to come to the table and meet all the relevant agencies at once mm -hmm. who can play different roles in, in providing support to finance a power project. Two, um, it's brought developers to the table that were not looking at Africa at all, for sure, and some weren't even looking outside the U.S., who would never have come to the table curious about what's all the hubbub about and they're now investing uh, in power generation in Africa. And three, uh, it's brought transaction-specific technical assistance to deals to make them move more quickly and close, whether that means you know, negotiating with the government, as was the case in Tanzania, to extend a power purchase agreements tenor uh, to make it uh, financeable, whether it means bringing, buying legal support so that governments could hire appropriate legal advisors to give, some us, give us someone to negotiate with. So those are the three things that I think Power Africa has done that really do show that a donor involvement can fill gaps that, that need to be filled to move um, power transactions forward. On the what could OPEC do to grow its now $20 billion portfolio um, faster, I mean, I'm, I'm super proud of having established renewable energy as our priority in 2010. We, we've grown tenfold, and we grew tenfold in two and a half years, which just shows how much underlying demand there is for support for investments in the sector. But in terms of how we could grow our portfolio, this, our single biggest constraint is not the greenhouse gas cap. Uh, it's not the availability of interested investors who need our support. It's staff and human resources. It's our budget. It's what Congress gives us every year to pay for staff to do those deals. And so I continue to make the case, and whenever, of course, I'm in Washington, uh, which is often, uh, to make the case that you know, it's odd that the U.S. government's development finance institution is so tiny compared to 
frankly, compared to the aid agencies in the U.S. government, compared to other development finance institutions of other countries with much smaller economies in Europe. So we continue to make the case that with a few more staff, two or three more deal teams, you know, we could grow that portfolio by 50%. Yeah, I think there's there's three or four things that we could do, at, or that we've begun to do. One, again, to decide to harp back on the same issue, but we have a big role to play in strengthening the project pipelines. And again, you know, I, I go back to my point <coughs> that, you know, the binding constraint, particularly in, in low-income countries, not the lack of external finance, it's the attractiveness in the pipeline. And you know this global infrastructure finance facility that I talked about is going to have a very strong has already a hundred uh, hundred million for the project preparation. Uh, we've got a couple of groups within within the bank who's who've recently been expanded and whose job is to do the the, the advising and the upstream uh, project preparation. So I think that's doing con doing more of that and that. And also getting more of a spirit of our job is not just to build roads. You know, a traditional World Bank project 40 years ago was you'd go in the country and sort of finance the building of roads or, or very old-fashioned projects. Whereas now, increasingly, there's there's emphasis on our role is to leverage our limited resources. So you know, at the height of the financial crisis, when the M multilateral development banks were disbursing as much as they could. We did about 90 billion in infrastructure that year. You know, estimates of infrastructure needs are all over the place, but you know, one trillion, two trillion. I mean, they're in the up there. So 90 billion is peanuts. Even if we doubled it, it's still peanuts unless we really do a good job of leveraging. So I think trying to change the culture in our institution and in others uh, that we move away from the old traditional deals to much more uh, leveraging, I think, is is a big part of our emphasis. Um, a third thing that we're doing, which is uh, fairly long term but really important, is the development of local capital markets. What we're seeing right now is that, you know, in, in a lot of places, the the, the, the financiers are, are not necessarily going in because, you know, there's currency risk, there's country risk, and so on and so forth. And where the deals are solid, it's it's often a lot of local local financiers. So in the Philippines recently, and at least in the big countries, there's money in in the country. The question is whether local regulatory framework enable, you know, bias the, the, the institutional away from domestic investment and so on and so forth. And what we tend to see is that the domestic financier understand the political economy better and tend to get into fewer of these big, you know, failures that, that you talked about. And then um, last but not least, and that's, you know, sort of beyond our control, but certainly the kind of uh, things we can use our bully pulpit uh, for and you know others are doing as well is addressing the biases in financial markets uh, for short-term finance, and that that is part of why you know such high returns are requested are required to attract uh, financing to to uh, to infrastructure deal. But so again, I'd put that at the lower end of the spectrum. I, I, I want to uh, open up to an audience full of uh, very knowledgeable people, but I, I, I just have to have a, a last question on uh, uh, on this. The, so you know, Power Africa has uh, ha has been growing, as you, you say, Elizabeth, and, and 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 the bank is doing more on, on project preparation. But if you look at probably the biggest possible power deal in in, in Africa, uh, the Inga uh, Inga Dam, the bank has has been involved in project preparation. Um, uh, uh, OPEC and Power Africa are not involved. Um, uh, I don't see that changing terribly much anytime soon. Um, you, you say, Elizabeth, that the, the, the carbon cap isn't an issue. Well, of course, right now there isn't a carbon cap, but next month there may be again. Uh, uh, it does seem that were OPEC to considerably expand its portfolio, the carbon cap would stop gas deals um, at some point um, and limit uh, OPEC's involvement pretty much to solar. Um, plus possibly geothermal, I guess. Um, there are real constraints driven by a community of people who are interested, I mean, uh, 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 rightly so, very concerned about uh, global environmental issues. There are issues ar 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 around um, uh, displaced peoples. Is there really the appetite and the ability uh, amongst Western donor agencies <coughs> to do big power deals anymore? Or are we going to be left with important and lovely uh, off-grid deals, plus maybe one or two gas deals for OPEC until we hit the cap. 
um, and you know uh, uh, maybe one or two power uh, uh, power deals for the bank. But you know basically, are the safeguards issues going to drive donors out of this this business? Well, I'll, I'll I think you're talking with a narrow focus because there is there are places that will finance coal that will you know this isn't just us alone. Whatever we say doesn't really affect a government that wants to get power on the grid and can't do it, you know, with, with this crowd, maybe they'll go somewhere else, which they do. Mm -hmm. So this is not a, and there's a whole, as we all know, I mean, you know, it's China, it's, you know, the AIIB now, you've got a whole different view and that, so there is other financing available and governments will, will go where the money is and they'll, and a president comes in for power, he wants to get power on the grid in the next five years before he, has, he or she has to run for re-election, you know, they're not going to wait around for a 10-year project. <clears throat> and I think that's the world we're in. And so you're right on, all the other, on what you said, but on the other hand, it's not a zero-sum game. There's someone else out there that will do something. Yeah, and just a, a point of clarification on, on our situation. I mean, when I say our number one constraint is, is resources and staff and execution capability, it's not the only constraint. And certainly were we able to grow as we ought to, we would certainly bump into constraints um, on the greenhouse gas cap that we've that we've uh, that we've been working under. Right now, we have capacity, and the the holiday under the cap, which was granted by Congress, has enabled us to send the signal to the markets. It's caused a lot more uh, fossil deals to come our way. Right now, our pipeline is about forty percent uh, thermal, um, and a lot of that's been able been allowed by this by this holiday. So I didn't mean to imply that it isn't a, a limitation. Of course. Uh, but it's nowhere near the limitation that, uh, that, that the lack of you know, execution capability uh, represents for us. As far as Inga is concerned, no, I mean, you did mention the word Inga, did you? Yes, okay. Um, <laughs> certainly, I mean, I, I think that I would defer to, to Marianne on that. I mean, as long as we're as small as we are and able, therefore, to be very selective, it's, it would be too complicated for us to take on because we'd be, you know, we'd have to be responsible for overseeing the entire thing and engaging with stakeholders who have keen interests in it. And we don't simply have the bandwidth to do that. So we would be relying on uh, following in the, put in, the, in the flying under the wing, if you will, of our, of our multilateral friends down the street. So we are doing big downs. We're doing big downs in Asia right now, we, you know, in Nepal. And by the way, big downs we're involved in were very solid and didn't burst during the earthquake. So <laughs> very happy to see that. Um, no, we are involved in these kinds of deals. I think Inga has this mythical, I mean, it, it's such a complex project. It is, in one, it is located in one of the most difficult and complicated countries in Africa. I mean, if Inga were located in South Africa, I think it would have been done a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we're mixing up all sorts of complications there uh, that go beyond the fact that it is a big hydro. <laughs> You know, again, I go back to this point that uh, Africa has a huge challenge in transmission lines. Uh, and I would say that that's perhaps where we're going to have the most important role as, you know, working with governments because that's what's going to enable all sorts of other things to come online, be it renewables or, or, or others. Um, so, yes, we, we have no choice but to do big dams. Um, hopefully we... We'll do them, I think we've learned a huge amount. We had a moratorium on, on big dams for a very long time. And during that time, there was a lot of analysis of how it can be done well. Um, are big dam one's favorite option? Not necessarily, but the problem is everything seems to have a drawback. And you know, where are we today? 33% access rates in Africa to electricity. We need to do something. Is it better to go for coal? Is it better to go for gas? Is it better to go for hydro? Is it better to go for geothermal? In very poor countries, we probably need to do a mix of everything. In others, hopefully, we can go towards a much cleaner mix. And it cannot be done without hydro. I think the other thing that, that gets missed in the discussion is, is you need a portfolio of power generation. You can't, you need a base load. And a base load can be provided by, by hydro, uh, geothermal, natural gas, coal. 
wind and solar, the intermittencies on that right now without the storage capability is too hard. I mean, we're running into that in, in Kenya with a wind farm that we've done along with the Turkana. Can the grid sustain you know, the intermittency because now you're going to have, I don't know what it will be at the end of the time, maybe 30% of the grid will be tied into this. Um, and that, that presents a, an issue for grid management, et cetera. You know, Germany's going through this right now with decommissioning the nuclear uh, fleet that they have and putting a lot more into wind. And what's happening is their costs are going up and all because it's a different it's a different factor of how you have to manage the whole overall power thing. So that portfolio is really important. Mm -hmm. And to your point, these countries don't have that option. I mean, it's it's something, you know, in South Africa does, and they're putting a lot of money in. They've done a lot in wind, and and it's a bigger, bigger piece. But the countries that have a a, a thousand megawatt base right now, and then you're going to add 500 megawatts of wind, it doesn't work. You know, there just isn't the technical aspects of it is too difficult until the storage stuff gets fixed or figured out. I've monopolized the questioning too long. Uh, let me open it up, but uh, please uh, let me o- open it up to questions, not long statements. Uh, uh, otherwise, I will cut you off and make, make up another question of my own. Uh, so, please. Uh. Uh, hello, my name is Meet Bayo Sande. I'm with the Africa practice at the law firm of Covington and Burling. <laughs> So one of the recommendations out of the President's Advisory on um, Council on Doing Business in Africa was the creation of a one-stop shop, for, particularly for infrastructure projects, opportunities, and helping private sector companies to identify projects to assist the companies and the countries to mature the projects so that they're bankable. And so I'm just wondering, what is the status of that recommendation? Like, Has it been received by the USG? Is it something that's going to move forward? Uh, yeah, we presented that to um, um, the Commerce Secretary and uh, the President um, in the last report that we did. Uh, we're progressing on that. We're going to have a meeting in another month, I think, Octo- middle October, where we'll have an, a, you know, another um, um, addition to what we think can make that much more effective. So we're progressing. So the answer is yes. Shift the focus to Asia, um, specifically the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that was just brought up. Uh, do you think that the AIIB will be able to partner with the ADB and the World Bank and thereby leverage more private capital than would otherwise be the case? And secondly, um, are you concerned at all about um, the role of China in financing projects that lend themselves to high degrees of corruption? And how do you see corruption playing out in the discussion that you've been having? Thank you. you well, I this? certainly uh, hope that we'll be able to partner with uh, Asian Development Bank and the uh, AIAB. Um, you know, one of one of the big issues is uh, the need for greater co- great coordination, and you know, we do a lot of deals with. Uh, joint deals with uh, multilateral, other multilaterals and, and bilateral agencies. As to your question on corruption, one of the things we've been um, pushing for in our discussions with the Chinese in general, uh, since, y- y- you know, they, as you probably know, they represent much greater financing than all the, in Africa, than all the MDBs put together. One of the things we've been discussing is whether they would consider applying the same procurement rules in Africa than they do at home. And that already would, would help certainly uh, improve the quality of projects and the quality of procurement. I mean, we work with uh, Chinese EPCs and get, have some projects financed. Um, and I think it's a question of, um, you know, we feel, that we, we feel comfortable with that because we're controlling the project, et cetera. So I think that's also part of it as well. But, you know, they're going to play a greater role. They're going to they're, you know, American companies and European companies are, we're under a pretty strict regulatory environment when it comes to that, and we pay attention to it. And so it's, you know, they want to deploy capital. Um, and at the, and I'll just make a plug right here, is that we have a thing called the Exim Bank that ought to be um, utilized to help, you know, combat that. So anyway, I'll get off the soapbox. <laughs> <coughs> 
right there we have three. Can we go to the back and then move forward? <laughs> you know, four. <coughs> yeah, my name is <coughs> sorry. My name is Afili from Sierra Leone, West Africa. I'm a student of Divine University in <coughs> Virginia. My question is for the my dad, second sitting on the second. Now we have Africa. Africa needs strong power electricity. Africa needs strong telecommunication infrastructure. Combined with that, Africa needs ICT in all schools. What is the way forward or the pathway so that information and communication technology could be taught with strong electricity availability and strong telecommunication infrastructure? Because for example, let's say this school, let's say Sri Lanka in particular as an example, we have three strong hydro power, hydro, uh, hydro power plant. Now we have the Big Congo Falls, that of Kono. We have the Bubuna Hydro. Then we have one in the third one in Kenema. Now, if we don't have a strong continuous power, how can ICT be taught in these schools? So we need strong hydroelectric power so that ICT could be taught in schools so that children could be in tune with the whole world because everybody has a cell phone, but not everybody knows how to manipulate a laptop. And education is a pivotal role in any development. So what will the international community do, especially the United States, so that we have a strong inflow of hydropower? So this is my question. I mean, I can so there are some very interesting projects uh, now that are, sh that are not only looking at private provision of education, private schools, that are on the one hand, in many cases, off-grid and run by, you know, elect electrified by solar, uh, solar panels that are attached to those schools. There are also a number of private, private schools that are now increasingly being run in a manner that utilizes technology to deliver that education to ensure a quality education when teacher training is not always, uh, is always available. So there is an interesting coming together of uh, renewable energy enabling schools to get power and and utilizing ICT to deliver high quality education and doing all of that in a way that's commercially viable if it's done at scale. This was actually the front page of uh, The Economist magazine a couple of weeks ago and highlighting one particular project in Kenya all the way across the continent from you uh, known as Bridges uh, Bridge Academies and they've done an extraordinary job of successfully providing uh, education through very small schools uh, for six dollars a month for students to that's all they're paying for these schools and the test results from those students is far far higher than the results they're seeing uh, from public schools so they're showing that you can run schools use I ICT and do so in a commercially viable way with very good results there were three more over there Yes, uh, Mima Nedelkovic, yeah. president of the Initial Global Development. Um, interesting discussion, but just a little bit curious of this growth or development issue. I just <laughs> didn't know whether one can have development without growth, and I don't know how you have growth if you don't have power. So I think we all end up in the same place. But the, the, the question and, um, on, on hydro, um, many moves ago I was on the board of the African Development Bank, so I know why the, the whole hydro issue, the backed up lakes and that came up. But I'm very curious over the years what's happened because the potential is not even 15%. I think it's more like 5% of the African water that is in any way bothered before it goes back to the ocean. But on hydro and looking at the, the pluses and minuses, the, the, the cost benefit, you're going to have displacement certainly, not in Inga, but the other dams. What at the time of the policy issue, do we also look at what is the cost of not having power? And what are those people that are not being displaced? Would they rather be displaced and have power? Would they rather not be displaced and not have power? I mean, at some point, we really have to be looking at that question from that standpoint and say, how do we capture now the other 95% potential of that water? 
I would love to hear a little something Can back I, on uh, that point. Just say I would be delighted to organise a panel, even with the same people, uh, on the discussion of growth and development uh, and uh -huh. the differences or the similarities between the two. But I don't think we're going to answer it right now, uh, or I'd, l I'd rather you didn't. Uh, but but perhaps focus in on on this question uh, of of what about resettlement and you know uh, the issues with re resettlement and how do we do it better? Because uh, it's clearly a political hot potato. So I think. You know, we, we've been involved in reforming our safeguards now for a while, and the idea is to make the safeguard a lot smarter without necessarily, uh, without loosening them, making sure that they do protect individuals and the environment. At the same time, as you pointed out, development does require that infrastructure be built, and most infrastructure cannot be built without some kind of eminent domain <coughs> approach. So that means that some people will have to be moved. The question is, you know, which one, and do we, do we make an intelligent choice about how to a, minimize the disruption, understand what might be some irreversible damages, make sure that people are duly compensated, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of extremely difficult questions, and the idea of the reforms of the safeguard is to, to be able to ask these questions and not necessarily say we can't do anything, but make sure that good reflection and, and, and good consultations are, are done around these things and that there is voice, and that the voice is not just to the people who will benefit from the power that are living in the capital somewhere far away, but also that there's local benefits and that uh, the disruptions are minimized. You run into the same thing in wind or solar. I mean, it's the same thing as here. People don't want it in their backyard, you know, and it's not like, and we're, you know, you have the ability to put a wind farm. We've, we've got a number of projects. We've had to deal with the community and making them part of it, making a solution that's equitable. Um, and it's, it is, it's an issue. And that's, I think, one of the other aspects of renewables. And one of the, I think, some of the, one of the misconceptions about Africa, <clears throat> oh, well, there's sunshines all the time. There's a lot of land. Well, people live on that land. And they're doing something when they're farming, and they're you know. So you've got to you've got to come up with the same solutions that you you do here with with some of that stuff. Uh, I I want to just add the that's an interesting uh, question you raise. One thing that we've seen again, just turning back to one of our experiences in Gabon, where we were were talking with the government about a hydropower project. But it was interesting from an engineering side to look at the project, uh, and it had to do with all the resettlement and the benefits, but look at the project less as a one-off project, but see how it's connected. So actually design the hydropower not to be just a power, but actually be part of mm -hmm. uh, the maritime, uh, be part of uh, you know, the other economic benefits. So it's a more systematic or systemic approach rather than just a, a one-off. That's sort of something that we found that helped to sort of build some of the economic incentives uh, both for the government and the communities that, that might need to move. Agriculture, yes. Uh, I'm a PhD student from China. I major in international law. And uh, thank you very much for the inspiring discussion. And um, as you all mentioned a lot about the power generation side, and I'm wondering, as in renewables, the intermittent renewables uh, become more and more, uh, it, it challenges the great ability to accommodate the intermittent energy, the electricity. So I'm wondering, could you please talk a little bit about the power transmission and distribution side, like what's the challenges for private investment to get into that side, especially like in China, uh, the government are promote robustly on the development of smart grids to upgrade the power grids, and uh, they are also reform the power sector to invite more private investors into that uh, that field. So I'm wondering whether you know the private investors are in really interested in that, or what's the challenges? Thank you. Well, it's not a technology issue. The technology is there today. It's, it's going to the utilities or the, the, uh, the distribution companies and saying, do you put a prepaid meter in a house? Do you stop the theft? Do you make sure that people are paying? That, that's fun. It's, that's it. It's not, a, it's not a technical issue at all. 
the smart grids can work as well, um, but it's a question of, you know, are you, and I think the prepaid meters, at least on the consumer side and even on the industrial side, are part of the solution to that. But it's a, I mean, if you, Ghana, I mean, the, MC, the Millennium Challenge Corporation is reforming one of the utilities in Ghana, ECG. And, you know, 70% of their billing goes uncollected. Guys that work for me haven't paid a bill in a year. I mean, so it's not a technical issue. It's a question of back to the political will and the capability of the institution, et cetera. So it, I think that's a lot of it from my perspective. A lot, but there is a technical issue on the quality of the transmission, which will come as you get more investment in there. But, but the aspect of having meters and all that, it's, that's not a technical issue. You can put, put them in today. You gotta collect the money which then makes it bankable and then, you know, works all the way back to the chain. We have a couple more minutes, so uh, I'm going to take that one. There's, there's one person with a microphone. And there was one person over here. Right. Those are the last two. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Alexander, Heinrich Bull Foundation. Thanks for the great panel. Um, Mr. Ireland, I was really interested in your comment about how, you know, investors can't expect to have a guarantee plus a 23% rate of return. And um, where do you find guidelines that ensure that given the low capacity to negotiate contracts, um, you know, investors aren't getting too big a share, uh, this is... This is important because you know inequality is growing so fast through dynamics like that. Um, so I'd really like to hear you expand on that. And also, um, you know, the World Bank Group and all the MDBs just sent many documents to the uh, group of twenty, uh, especially its uh, infrastructure and investment working group. And it would be great to hear how, if at all, the uh, push of the G20, you know, it sees global growth coming from infrastructure and how that tremendous push of the G20 affects um, the global environment and uh, these 100 MDB working groups that are all collaborating on infrastructure, I mean, must create a very different dynamic for the bank. It would be interesting to hear how that works. So. Maybe I can start with the, the second question. So um, the French G20 is really what started, well, the Koreans started talking about infrastructure, but then it became big with the French G20. And you know, th there's always a big question of what's the comparative advantage of the G20. It's not a pledging forum at all. Um, and so and what we saw with infrastructure is that it's either a finance question or it's a behind the border set of issues as we've just talked about. So th this raises a huge question mark about what on earth the G20 could contribute to the debate. I think what we managed to, to do through the various years of the G20 and the many, many working group and the many, many papers we have sent to the G20 <laughs> upon request, I should say, um, <laughs> is we're not supply driven, they were demand driven. <laughs> So one of the things we did manage is to dispel a number of myths, and in particular, the one I keep harping upon, which is this issue that it's really a project pipeline problem. And as a result of that, as a result of all this debate, came the creation of the global infrastructure facility that we have, which has 100 million ready uh, in the coffers for project preparations. So there's, there's a number of things that have changed. Um, the, the various infrastructure working groups uh, are also sort of helping coordinate a number of initiatives. Uh, it's also helping stop new initiatives so that we can sort of focus on strengthening some of the existing ones. Um, so a number of good things have happened, I think, uh, through that. Um, and you know, we as a World Bank are hoping that it will also help us fundraise so that there's more resources available in the future to do more of this kind of project preparation, finance you know, guarantees, and so on and so forth. I mean, like Elizabeth, we are constrained by our resources. Um, there's a limit to how much leveraging we can do. So to the extent that the dialogue is changing at the G20, which are most of our shareholders, I think that in of itself is, is of interest. 
You asked about what, what guidelines, where, where can one find guidelines for what's a fair uh, deal? And I'm happy to offer you a very simple tool that we developed. Uh, we developed in consensus with other development finance institutions as well as other US government agencies. We developed a literally one page document that lists the 10 elements of a bankable power purchase agreement. So the, and the purpose of that was to actually have something super simple that, that accelerated the consensus between a developer and a government on what was fair. Um, because we find sometimes, you know, months or years can be lost negotiating things that are really not, shouldn't be negotiated, that are, that are pretty much widely accepted as necessary uh, in those deals. So if you're interested in this one page, 10 elements of a bankable power purchase agreement, you can either drop your card off with me or maybe we can post it on your website uh, or something like that so it could be made available to anyone. As long as one of the 10 is transparency, mm -hmm. you can go up there. Um, well, we, people have found it very, very helpful. I know we ha we've had a lot of demand for it, so. And the last question is right here. Thank you. I'm Dan O'Neill from Cardno. In Elizabeth's opening statement, she said that she found that there were was too much money chasing too few projects. Or Marion said that, that and I think nice. Elizabeth said something similar. If I could ask Jay and Tam, do you think this is true, that there really is too much money chasing too few projects? And if so, could. what could an institution like OPIC yeah. or World Bank do to build a bigger pipeline, to create identifying more opportunities for private investment? Yeah, I tend to agree with, uh, from, from, my, uh, from our perspective, our, my perspective, there is, uh, uh, we've seen a discernible pattern of the lack of capacity to actually, you know, at the local level to actually identify a good project to actually, you know, draw in investors and to draw in contractors uh, such as ourselves. So, you know, the I, that's why I always felt that there's still a strong role for the donors and OPIC to actually help, you know, I know it's not the most sexy answer in the world, but to help build that capacity on the ground specifically to actually not only identify a good project, uh, but how you're going to actually execute the project. And then when for companies that get contracted like a Bechtel to finish a project and we hand it over to actually operate that project for the next 30, 40 years through very turbulent times, changes in administrations, et cetera. I mean, that, that's still, and we find that uh, in the emerging markets, uh, still a, a very, you know, a consistent issue. I think also in the, in the developing markets, um, so, and I'll speak of Africa specifically, but we find a, a very limited source of knowledgeable, experienced, properly capitalized developers that can bring a project to make it a good bangable project. A lot of times people have the license or the ideas and they've never been in doing power generation or whatever, and I think that's a dynamic that, that has got to get better. So there's very few, and you know, I've had I've had a number from tell me that they're they left one of the institutions and they're going to start out on their own to develop projects. And I go, oh yeah, really? Uh, yeah, we're going to be in Washington and we'll fly over now and then. It's like, okay, fine, but you know, that the stuff like that doesn't work. So I think that's and that's a key in starting to get the because the development phase is the key because once you get it through that to a financeable or understand what the issues are from a financeable. So we're, we're investing our own money in a number of projects at project development phase with equity investments, et cetera. And it's still difficult. And you know, so I've been, it's been a very big learning process for me on how difficult these can be, but you know, and they're there and it's not, and it's not just, you can, you know, we have a project in Ghana right now that we're trying to pull the fuel all the way to the, to the evacuation, you know, because we think it can work and they're, you know, we're behind it and the whole thing. And it's still a very difficult thing for a lot of different reasons. But I think there will be more, and I think there's also an understanding on the government side of what has to, what they need to do to make it more, and it doesn't have to be sovereign guarantees. It has to be making sure that, you know, through administrations, the, uh, the contracts are honored, you know, uh, things like that, which we're seeing more and more of, so. It's been, been good from that standpoint. So on our side, I would say that improving the project pipeline is one of our major priority, and this is why we, we, we've now got three units within the bank that are working on different aspects of that. 
uh, of providing technical support, you know, uh, some amount of financing and so on and so forth. So that I think is really where we want to be. Does any of the panelists have any final thoughts, closing remarks? Other. Maybe just one thing. When, when we talk about private finance we, and infrastructure, we tend to think about the, the, the private sector coming in and you know, building the power plant or something like that. But one interesting experience is that of Asia, where a lot of the private financing comes via SOE financing. So the SOEs, you know, state-owned enterprises, borrowing on, 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 on the international markets. And there, what becomes really critical to bringing the private sector financing is, is for these agencies to be rated, credit ratings. So I don't think Africa is too close to being there now, but it is another way of bringing in uh, private financing, and one that could be very important in the future if, you know, in, in countries mm -hmm. where the governance is such that the SOEs could uh, eventually get a good credit rating. Oh, thank you. It is uh, fascinating how often discussions about development start out with, gosh, this is going to cost a lot, and end up with, you know, money's not really the problem. Um, this one, uh, no exception, but, but uh, thank you very much. I certainly learned a lot. Um, please uh, uh, do show your appreciation and join us for drinks afterwards. <laughs>